so can we talk about a, a release date for a book maybe? no <laughs> <laughs> i mean you could ask me i don't know what i'll say Hello, intelligent beings of this marvellous planet. Welcome to the 42 Courses podcast and thanks for listening. Dan Nelkin is an award-winning freelance creative director for Canada's top creative ad agencies, the world's largest brands and rising startups around the world. And he's the author of the soon-to-be-released A Self-Help Guide for Copywriters due out in October 2021. He has a quickly growing newsletter entitled A Self-Help Guide for Creatives where he helps marketing professionals build their creative craft and confidence. You can join over 3,000 people by subscribing at nelkincreative.com. As Dan says, it's free, short and dead easy to unsubscribe. I always look forward to his next post on LinkedIn and the latest newsletter because I'm a huge fan of his humor, wordplay and fantastic creativity. So I'm really happy to say hello to Dan Nelkin. Hi. Well, that makes one of us, Brent. I'm I'm kidding. I actually, I watched, you sent me an example of uh, someone you've interviewed and he was, he was amazing. I'm forgetting his name, but the body language. Mark Bowden. He's actually in Canada where you are. Oh, really? But I, I watched his TED talk and he said something about public speaking. And that really resonated with me and I, and I hope helps me through this. But he talked about being more in, in a, inauthentic. Yeah. And so, because I think when we do these things, like if I was being completely authentic and embracing my anxiety, um, I would be way more awkward. But I, I think, you know, the thing is to say, oh, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Um, <laughs> it's not that I'm not, but you know, you know what I mean? I think that was just such a wonderful like piece of feedback, I think for anyone, um, especially me where I try when I write to have an authentic tone of voice, especially when I'm sharing. And, uh, if I am awkward or anxious, I often will write that, mm-hmm. um, but for these kind of things to, to be curled up in a ball interviewing me, it probably wouldn't be the best, uh, for the people watching. <laughs> Does that mean that you're the kind of uh, classic stereotypical copywriter, the introvert, that kind of, you know, wordsmith, but doesn't like, you know, being yeah. extrovert in front of people? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm a, I'm a bit of both. Like, I think a lot of people are in whatever setting. But I, th- I think as a writer, especially in the ad agency world, you're just, we have often lots of time. There's lots of people looking at things. They're thought through. They're over thought and overanalyzed. So I'm quite comfortable in writing when I'll write a piece. If I don't feel like it's ready to share, I'll wait a week or two weeks. But with something like this, uh, I, I need a response uh, right away. And, you know, it's like being a writer in a boardroom. I'm like, hey, you're the writer. What's a fun way of saying X? I always like, ah! Uh, I did think of a hack though yesterday for this call. I can just, if you ask a question that I don't have an answer to, I, yeah i'll just pause and you'll think my screen is frozen the freeze frame classic classic. yes (laughs) anyway (laughs) so look we we jumped we jumped in and i I didn't even say thank you for your time but i mean and i'm i'm really excited to speak to you because i i'm a a a new fanboy let's Mm -hmm. say um and i know your audience is growing like so quickly on on linkedin and and twitter and um just, just to explain to people that might be experiencing you for the first time, what it is that you're the kind of content that you're putting out on those channels. Yeah. Um, so I have writ- written a book that I've been working on for, for way too long. Uh, maybe it's, it's, it's normal for, for a, a book, probably is. Uh, and so I was really kind of alone in that process. I also had never embraced social media. And uh, so it's kind of just before the pandemic kicked off. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to start posting content from this book because I'd already been working on it for a while. And I said, it will help me see if it resonates with anyone. Uh, and also help me kind of refine the content. And so I just made a commitment to post something once a week on LinkedIn. And uh, so that was it. And I've what I've done is I always felt like you know, in ad agencies, they tell you how, how important it is to work on your craft. It was never really explained to me what the hell that meant. It was like, yeah, okay, I get it. Uh, art directors, it was often said about them. And I thought, oh, you know, they know lots of colors or whatever that meant for an art director. But for a writer, 
which was a, actually a title I, I never embraced and probably rebelled against early in my career. Um, and so I think what happened was I became an insecure copywriter, insecure only about my ability to write, to strategy wise, uh, coming up with ideas. I was confident, but actual writing, um, yeah, it wasn't my strong suit or if I did have any skill in it in the beginning, it kind of faded. And, uh, you know, I felt like I've gone too far in my career to still be insecure about uh, writing headlines. So that's what the book is about. I feel like it's a foundational skill. Uh, and I feel like I've dumbed it down. I think it's probably the dumbest book on copywriting ever written. Uh, it's, it's, it's what I needed. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, what I'm most shocked by is not that it helps someone who's starting out or two years into their career. I, I'm shocked that very senior people uh, in this industry around the world are reaching out to me to say thank you. Uh, and I, I had a, a suspicion that would be the case because I, I was, you know, quite senior, as you can tell by my, my hair. And uh, there was a creative director at Lululemon at the time. He was writer background, met him for lunch. And I told him kind of about what I was working on. This was probably five years ago. And uh, I told him about my insecurity in writing headlines. And he said, I feel the same way. And I was like, eh. I started to ask more people, more of my peers. And yeah, it wasn't everyone, but there was a lot who felt that way. And so I felt like there was something uh, missing. Obviously this industry, for 30 years is shifting more and more visual. And so I think uh, I felt pressure to think more visually, which I really enjoyed. But, you know, my uh, skills as a writer weren't developing. So I'm working on them now and sharing that. Well, I disagree about the dumbing down because I've had the honor of get, uh, reading through the, the, the yeah. preview. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, I've, I've been a copywriter for many years and I, I found really great stuff in there. And, you know, the, the frameworks, the tools that you're using for, for banging out the headlines. And the, I want to come to that in a, in a bit about the, the processes that you go through. It's really, really, really interesting for, uh, for, for new and, as you say, senior copywriters, I think. Anyway. Thank you. Just sticking with the, uh, the newsletter for a moment, hey. which is absolutely fabulous. The, there's an electricity there's an electricity in your sentences so yeah. you you must be really proud of that and but yeah. what i wanted to say about it because i i heard um i think on another podcast where i was listening to you and yeah. uh you know when you're starting out a new thing that there's there's all the stuff you can find on linkedin and everywhere business advice is just start right, right? when you're starting something new but I think your the, starting with the newsletter, the, the origins of it, the history of it was don't start. Was that the thing? Don't start. Because it took well, ages to get it going and you oh, were doing I, I, a course, right? Yeah, well, well you, this book was supposed to be, it started out as a potential course that may be one day. Uh, it's funny now, and I don't know why, but just last week was something I shared. And I guess the audience is growing and you can see how... You know, it amplifies when you get to a certain level and it grows, grows quicker. But I don't know if there was like a hotline for universities around the world, but for the first time since I started doing it, probably four or five messages last week to ask me to speak to graduating classes um, uh, coming in the fall. So uh, I'll be doing, I'll be doing that. Uh, but uh, yeah, don't, don't start. Uh, well, when, when I was sharing articles on LinkedIn, I used to tag them because someone said, oh, I, I miss these. I enjoy your articles, but I, I don't always get them. And they said, uh, you should start a newsletter, which is something I, I never thought of starting. I never wanted to start. Uh, I don't like them. Uh, and so I just would tag the articles uh, and just said, hey, if you want to subscribe to a newsletter, I'll probably never start. Enter your email address here. And people seem to like that and i'm like are they signing up because they like the content or like that i maybe won't actually start it uh and then uh i thought uh well it got to uh i don't know what it was at that time like 500. i thought okay i i guess i should do this and i'm so glad i did uh i think because i don't like what i don't like about newsletters um, i think honestly it makes makes me good at it but i 
I want to provide value and I don't want to take up too much time. And sometimes I think if I can provide more value, but it make, it would make it longer. I still don't do it. Um, because I think over time, it's just like, well, I can't not talk like this now because I'm sharing this content about being a, a good creative. So many, um, iconic creatives would say don't work yourself to exhaustion in any one session like leave something in the tank for the next mm -hmm. day even if you're going good in fact some say stop when you're going good so you know where to pick up the mm -hmm. next day and i just feel like i could write the most amazing newsletter one week but if it was too long um yeah i think i would exhaust people uh, so i don't i don't have the time either to to write too long and I don't want to, it's just something short at the beginning of, of your week to hopefully uh, get you thinking a bit uh, differently about creativity. Okay, and actually we haven't mentioned about like your actual history before the newsletters and everything. Can you just give a, a quick rundown of, of what you've done in your in your career? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I went to, I'm in Canada, by the way, which I think you may have mentioned. I'm in Vancouver. Uh, I went to Toronto for, at that time, the only ad school in Canada. Uh, and then after that, I got a job uh, driving a forklift back here in Vancouver. Uh, and then I got my first agency job after about six months. And I was working at Cosset, so the biggest Canadian agency in, in Vancouver, which was not, not very uh, creative at the time. And then I moved on to TBWA, Shiat Day, uh, Vancouver. Uh, and then I was there for a little while, starting to do well, uh, you know, the whole uh, whatever advertising awards thing and uh, winning a bunch. And but that's kind of when I burnt out. And uh, from there, it's been kind of, I don't know, I, I left and I, this like decent sized client fell in my lap. And I didn't want to start an agency. But at that time, I didn't want to work for one. So whatever, I, I, I gave it a name and hired some people and, and I never grew beyond that one client. I never wanted to. I didn't have a, you know, a new business uh, partner or anything. And then once, once that ended, I was ready for change and uh, actually worked for an animation studio for four years as a creative director uh, and uh, a partner in that. And then, oh, that's when uh, it was funny because I was out of the ad scene for about probably 10 years because I had my own little agency and I wasn't entering things in award shows. I, that's, I didn't care. It was like... Uh, my quality of life was was most important and happiness because I had burnt out and uh, I was happy. Uh, so once that ended, uh, the animation thing, that was amazing too. And kind of business dried up and slowed. And so I was like, well, what the hell am I going to do now? And someone called me a good agency and we're like, hey, we want you. Do you still do this? Can you? I'm like, I'm not sure. Uh, and I went in and did a job and I, I don't think I was very good, but I was partnered with one of the top creatives he's one of the top in the world his name is rob sweetman and i felt like a advertising uh, you know caveman who had just been thawed and uh man he was so sharp and so i worked with them on and off for a bit that's 123 west they're an amazing agency great people and yeah people just started to heard i i was i was back and i think thought maybe i had passed away or something i don't know and everyone started calling and i, I got it back and uh I think the break ha had me just thinking very differently about creativity. Uh, not that I wasn't doing it, I was still creative, but I wasn't doing this exactly. And uh, I think I brought a different perspective and I could also see what I felt was maybe wrong and inefficient about the process. Um, yeah, it was, it was very cool because I felt like I kind of got out of it and came back mm -hmm. and uh, loved it in a different way. Um, and then, yeah, it just started to get calls from agencies and brands. And while working on this content, kind of at the, the start of that, I felt like uh, there was a room for something like this. So that sounds like Return of the Jedi. You turned up like Luke, all dressed in black. You know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. The, the Dagobah system. And yeah, all exactly. Yeah. Hey, but just jumping back to the start there, this is, this yeah. is a really interesting thing because you were doing manual work. And, oh, yeah. uh, and, and then you, and then you say you, you just jumped into the agency world. And this is really interesting for people starting out their careers or wanting to change careers. Lots of people want to get into marketing. How did you do that jump? That's a big jump. How did you manage that? You know, I don't know why there was always something inside of me that 
I thought I worked in a, a blue collar town, but yeah, I guess it did. You know, that was just what you did. I remember when I, what was I doing? Oh, I was quitting my job in the warehouse. And at the time, my girlfriend at the time, her, it was her grandma was like, you know, that's a, a really good job, or maybe you should consider driving a bus. Like there wasn't a, uh, it was a low ceiling. And I was like, I just knew that wasn't a, a good job for me that I wouldn't be happy. So, you know, I drove a forklift before I worked in advertising and uh, I left uh, to go. I was making decent money. I probably was a 50% uh, pay cut. You know, I think the biggest lesson in that, uh, the pay cut when I went and started in advertising, I went to an ad school. I left this, this warehouse. Um, you know, I thought for sure I would make it and this would be my career. And I didn't. I think I was the only one of almost 60 students that didn't get an internship uh, with an agency. So wow. I had to start paying back my student loans and came back to Vancouver and tail between my legs, went back to the warehouse, Honda Canada. And uh, yeah, they, they punished me. It was union. They didn't want me back. But uh, so they threw me on like garbage duty, which you normally have for, you know, four hours a week. I did it every day, about seven hours uh, for probably three months. I didn't complain. Uh, I, I just kind of, I knew, I knew it wasn't my future. I knew enough in the ad school that I could do it. Um, so I think that's maybe the lesson for people who want to get into it. Like there's just something about it. I knew I could do it and I just believed in it and kept going. I worked on my portfolio, uh, throwing garbage into that baler and walked into an ad agency, it's DDB. And they didn't have anyone set me down the road. And I was on a week to week contract uh, making peanuts uh, every Friday. I didn't know if I would come back and uh, man, I got some briefs and uh, worked my arse off and they had to hire me. But that, that's a really interesting bit, right? Cause you weren't working in it, but you, you said you were working on your portfolio. So what was that? You were making your own briefs and your own tasks for yourself or you were rewriting stuff that was already out there? Or? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so to get a job in an ad agency as a copywriter, art director, or, you know, uh, any on the creative side, you need a portfolio of your work. And back then it was like five print campaigns. So uh -huh. uh, one idea executed three different ways and mm -hmm. you needed five of those. So I worked on it. Obviously I had a book coming out of school that some agencies liked. Uh, yeah. I didn't get an internship because I think the school, uh, I think they th maybe thought I had an attitude. Uh, maybe I did. I don't know. <laughs> I would just say what I do now. I think my, my content works. I say what other people are thinking sometimes, but not mm. saying. And okay. I said it then. I didn't mean offense by it. And I think maybe they're worried about me making the school look bad. I don't know. Okay. Um, All right. But jumping forward. So you, you yeah. eventually award winning. So uh, would, yeah. I'm interested to know. As, as an award winner, would you say that those are your proudest bits of work or is it that's just not involved in it? Like what, what are the, the highlights of your copy or creative directive career? Do you know, you know, it's funny. I, I can't even, even the biggest awards that I won, it's not, it's not that work doesn't stand out. That's not mm -hmm. always the case. I'm not saying this across the board. Some mm -hmm. creatives have done amazing, better work than I have. And I'm sure um, it's deserved of the awards and that's what they're most proud of. But I guess for me, um, uh, yeah, it's the human kind of struggle or the wonderful people that stand out for me or the things I had to overcome. Like that, and there was uh, a McDonald's uh, brief very early on in my career. I didn't, it was when I was on this week to week contract. There's a creative team beside me working on uh, McDonald's uh, new thick cut McDonald's wedge fries are back, but for a limited time only. Uh, the brief, that, that was the brief, that was the payoff line in the TV spot. Anyway, they said, uh, here's a brief. The art director said, hey, you can think on it if you want, thinking whatever. He just give me like whatever, something to chew on, but I wouldn't come back with anything. But I was, I'm competitive. And also I knew when I get my shot, I'm going to do it. And there was TV on that brief, billboards, radio. Uh, and man, within two days, I walked over and I'm like, oh, here's something. It was like a full sketchbook, hundreds of ideas. Put them all on the wall with theirs. Um, yeah, I'm making like eight cents an hour. Creative director comes, looks at all the work, picks eight things to present that were all 
from my sketchbook, but he didn't know because the art director sketched him up. I knew, I knew they knew. Um, and that was early in my career. It, that campaign was so successful and I actually changed the brief because the, the brief they want to focus on limited time only. And I thought they should focus on these being a bigger fry, but there was all these low carb diets at the time. That's right. It was that mm -hmm. guy. I don't know if you had it out there, uh, Subway. And there was that guy, Jared, he's a fireman and a Subway fan. He's Jared. And he apparently lost all this weight from eating foot long subs. Uh, that's, <laughs> that was their thing. Uh, and so they were afraid to embrace uh, these big high carb products. And I was like, mm -hmm. I didn't get to present because I used to, I mean, they just left me at, at my desk. But um, anyway, that, that went through. The campaign was so successful, they had to pull it because they had sold so many of these wedge fries and wow. they had only budgeted to buy a certain amount. So that was like a huge, huge thing for me. Um, I remember that the, I was told after the creative director said to the team, well, how was working with Dan and no, nope, they didn't say anything, uh, even though it was mine. And I think the, the art director had told me years later that he was leaving it for the writer to say something because he didn't, you know, want to like overstep. And when this person didn't, he said he went back and uh, told the creative director that he'd love to work with me. And that I think kept me off a of forklift that because uh he had no idea i'm not the type and never will be to say i did that and uh you know i, I think i probably would have made it still because i knew i did that and uh, that was enough out to probably but that was a key, key moment for you yeah. huge yeah i had a okay. few of them for sure uh, but at this stage you weren't uh i imagine you weren't doing the kind of uh processes that you have in oh. your book about like the the banging out the headlines, 100 headlines, 50 headlines in 30 minutes. You hadn't reached this. Uh, no, this no, no, no. You know, of... Yeah, I, I was a bull in the beginning with my brain, I think. And I just, I loved, I did love it though. I, I it kind of came, the ideas came easy. The writing never, never did. Um, I could come up with ideas for days and I did way too much. What I said earlier about, you know, stop while you're going good. Like I'd go to bed with a sketchbook and uh, it, there's like ink marks. I remember on my bed sheets and stuff. I, it wasn't good. I think that came from insecurity though. And this, you know, people have gone through way worse struggles than I have. I'm quite privileged, but this, my own struggle to get the job to whatever my own doubts and other people who doubted me, uh, you know, even my dad saying, you know, he couldn't take my losses and was like, you know, maybe you should, uh, maybe you're not good enough is actually what he said, which is like, he can do that to, sh I think it's to shock me to be like, geez, you know, if he's not, and he keeps pushing, I'm just going to present this option to him. He should probably consider it. I knew though, he didn't know what I was doing in these sketchbooks. I knew, oh. okay. but no, I, di I didn't have, I had a lot of anxiety, uh, which I didn't realize. I think I maybe had fake confidence growing up and then a career started and uh, cracks, you know, you act like you know everything and all of a sudden, uh, there we go. Well, so, yeah. I, I have to say you're flying now because the, 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 the wordplay in the book, in, in, your, in your LinkedIn stuff, your Twitter, uh, yeah, I, I just look so much forward to reading your sentences. Let me give uh, an example, one from the book. Okay. If you've been in the advertising business for more than three hours, you'll be familiar with this question, but it's a good one to revisit, even if your name rhymes with David Bogleby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love it, love it, love yeah. it. And, and that's yeah. one of your, your things, as you say, leave it till the end, leave the, the payoff until the yeah, end, yeah. right till the end. Yeah. Fantastic. But I wanted to ask about this because yeah. obviously, you know, it's a book on copywriting. There's David Ogilvy, there's Burnback, et etc. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, these legends are like, you know, just from a time aspect and from a sociological aspect, from, uh, are they too far removed for people that are getting into copywriting now to have them as their heroes? Or do you think it's like you, you have to respect the classics, respect the masters? And Yes and no. Um... I think, you know, when I read a lot of times, like if it's their books or quotes, where they help me now, it's like bigger picture. I think 
that has really stood the test of time. I don't have any top of mind, but they're like thoughts on working with clients, on the industry, on creativity. Uh, you look at, uh, oh, I'm going to forget his name. It's, it's got like three first names, but Webster is one of his, it's like his middle name. Okay. The old school uh, ad man who wrote the like five steps to coming up with ideas. Bill Burnback, I believe, wrote the foreword in his book. He did. Um, that is incredible. I just reread that not long ago. It's like a, a five-step technique to pr producing ideas. I think you can find it like a PDF somewhere online. Mm -hmm. That stood the test of time. I think the big picture things from them, absolutely. Um, little picture and craft. I never worked with them, and I'm sure back then, craft and writing was the dominant part of this you would just send it to the they weren't called art directors then whatever they were guys in the studio very beginning and you would just bill burnback was the first to put them together yeah but the writers led the way they would like write the copy and say picture kind of goes here and, and send it up to the to the puppets and then this still bugs me but uh, the giving art director is such a, a way better title than copywriter you always see like uh, job postings. They want art directors and like copywriters. It's just like, I saw a brief once. Uh, I won't name the company, or maybe I will. No, on the brief, it said creative plus copywriting was required. I was like, yeah, not happy with that. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you've mentioned about working on your craft and it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a, a thing in the book, of course, as well. Yeah. Um, so you said that the, Back in the day, you was you were told to work on it, but you didn't know what it meant. So, what what do you think it means now? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. I've thought about it. Uh, obviously, um, I think it just means to to learn and grow. And I think we can be so. I had a guy message me the other day. He just started working in advertising, first job, decent agency. He's he's twenty, and he's like, you know, I feel like I don't know anything. I was like, you don't like. <laughs> That's because you don't, and that's okay. Um, and I think we, we feel like we should know for some stupid reason. I think it might be harder even for people. Um, I started, I was 27 going on 28 when I started. So I've, some people, and I had gray hair, I had gray hair since I was like eight, I feel like. But so I think they assumed, oh, this guy's been doing it a while. And I was like, well, I better pretend that I have. Um, and then I think with that approach, it took me a lot longer to learn things. You just assume that confidence will develop over time, but it actually, it really doesn't. You have to be deliberate with working on your craft. Uh, often like related to basketball players, you hear about these guys, uh, all athletes, I'm sure. But I was surprised the first time I heard an athlete, I don't know if it was LeBron James or Kobe Bryant, someone say, reference their sport as a craft, working on their craft. Mm -hmm. And when you look into what these guys do and, and, and girls, you know, if they're good with their left hand, they'll work on their right hand. They obviously have their um, dominant skills, but they're working on their craft and their weaknesses. And I, what I did was just, I just focused on my strengths. And the longer my career is gone, the demand for those other things has like increased or to be able to teach them and help people. And when there was a bit of a hole there, um, I, I, I don't know, got me thinking and you know, one thing I've learned from sharing content are the things that we experience the strongest in agencies or our greatest insecurity or anywhere is usually when we feel most alone and um, want to hide and, and run through a wall or a window. But I've realized that when I share those things, those are when you have the most company. They're the mm -hmm. most relatable things. Mm -hmm. And that's helped me sharing content is when I come across one of the, those thoughts I'm pretty sure I've got one and I share and most of the time I'm right. Or people say, thank you. Uh, and it's good to know uh, that other people are going through the same way and uh, yeah. feel the same way. Uh, it lessens it. No, like, Okay. This is normal. It was yeah. like uh, Jerry Seinfeld who said, uh, I heard him recently on a podcast that he said he once heard that depression was like part of the kit that kind of comes with creativity. And he said, and when I learned that, I kind of accepted it because of, you know, without that, I wouldn't have this. And he, he talked a lot on this podcast about creative people and by creative people, I, I mean people. Uh, but I think people who are drawn 
but more to creativity, professional creatives. I think they're more sensitive people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're sensitive to observations and humanity and things. And so, um, Probably because yeah. you have to be, you have to put yourself in the customer's shoes. You have to be yeah. empathetic to be a copywriter in, in, in particular, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I had a podcast with a guy called Derek Walker in the States, a uh, copywriter, and uh, he's got his own little agency and uh, really- Brown, Brown. Brown and Brown, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he was doing some really fantastic insights of, uh, like respect the craft of copywriting. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, like, you know, there's no company in the world that has released a product overnight. They take three years to do R and D and then, Hey, you want us to write something? The copywriters, you want us to write something that will change people's minds and all the things that are required, um, for someone to purchase. And you want us to do that in 48 hours. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and he was saying that, um, so I said, what advice have you got for young copywriters? And he said that you have to, you have to respect the craft in the fact of saying no to unmeetable deadlines because you're, you're, you're saving yourself from the burnout. And like you were saying, yeah, he said, if you keep saying yes, you'll never be able to say no. Yeah. Yes. And I, 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 it's, it's difficult though, when you're, when you're young and you're new at the game, right. You know, saying, yeah. Well, I think the hardest thing when you're young is like that you don't know what you don't know. I think that's why more experienced people have to look out for those timelines, have to look out for those people on those timelines. Also, it feels good to say yes. Recently, an agency uh, a few weeks ago said, can you just help us on this little thing? They had a writer who was away and wanted me to take over. And I said, it's only five hours. Like, I've never done a job in the history in the last 20 years that took five hours. And I looked at the schedule and there was about three hours of meetings. I was like, <laughs> I don't know how this is possible. Uh, and it was a super tiny thing, but it took, you know, 12 hours. Uh, next week, an agency called me and said, hey, we have a really small thing. I just finished. I've been doing longer stints, so I've not been like, a, and I had a month off. So I was like, well, I'll take a, a little little job here and there, just a couple. And anyway, there's another agency who phoned and said uh, five hours. I was like, what is going on? I'm like, someone, I'm friendly with them. I was like, someone yep. else, that agency did the same thing. And I'll tell you, this one job is probably 15 hours, but I can do it. So, and if I'm not in any meetings, I'm like, I can probably do it in 12. Um, but I think going back to, to your point and your chat with Derek, if you're not aware of your process, you don't even know how long it takes for you to come up with things. If you don't have a process, it gets even harder. If you're going to have a meeting in there and you're going to stress and spend some time telling yourself you're not good enough and your career is over, you know, you need some time for that. Um, so, yeah, I think these short timelines are, are I had a, I'm, I'm talking so much, I guess that's the point a little bit, but uh, I had a, a very unique contract recently for the startup based out of Spain. And uh, it was three months, but it started out as one month. And the first month was really rare. He said, uh, I said, I'd like to do, we had a conversation and his brand's business is just doing well. We just have a brand. And I said, give me a month. I'm just going to come up with ideas on every platform. He didn't know what his brand was. I didn't know what it could be. And normally, you know, you start with a strategy and then you develop creative, but I always feel like they should be developed together. Like um, strategy should be creative. Creative should be strategic, but separating them is, uh, I, I find they're, they're, too separated and anyway so i just came up with a ton of ideas which really when you have a ton of ideas and different avenues to explore each one is kind of a strategy uh, so that was the first month and i feel like this is it and we nailed it down to one thing and then he's like well i actually have some specific things coming out that we need to create ads for and need messaging around and he wanted me to create something another document was I was really happy with it. It was rules for the company. Mm -hmm. He's kind of like a modern guy. It was like work for four days a week, very much aligned with kind of my, my approach to things. And so I wrote this document and then I decided the one thing was wrong from that we got out of that month. And I said, I want to redo it all. I think it's wrong. And I think it's this, let me write it up. And then he said, yeah, uh, okay. Actually, I didn't tell him what I thought it was, but I just said I thought it was wrong. And I spent another month creating two different documents. And I feel like I nailed it. 
and he was so happy. And we both were. Never get that chance. It was three months to figure it out. And I work for companies where you get two weeks or agencies will call me because I, I still freelance for agencies uh, or brands. I prefer, I prefer brands, especially smaller ones. But uh, the agencies, I think clients are more demanding. They need more content on more platforms faster than ever before. Yeah. And agencies are going, okay. just like to Derek's point, uh, hopefully he sounds like he's saying no, which is awesome. And sometimes you got to turn things around quickly. But some agencies I've worked for five years ago versus now, the change is ridiculous in timelines. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so what advice would you have for, um, for any level of copywriter who's like, who's in that, like that whirlpool or the, the washing machine of it all. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you, you spoke about burnout. What, what yeah. advice would you have for them for like to avoid burnout if, yeah. if, if any at all possible? I, you know, honestly, it can be hard, um, because you're working for a company and a lot of these uh, agencies uh, uh, shy at day used to be nicknamed shy at night and day uh, a lot of them ha had nicknames like that the one in, in la um it kind of became the culture so i think it's once you're in it and you buy in and I, it's not fair to blame agencies you know i think it's to blame i think if there's one takeaway from like what i'm doing is that we're doing creativity wrong way wrong in agencies and and I think it's going to be exposed. It is being exposed by burnout. There was a survey done recently. I don't have it in front of me, but um, I forget the company who did it, but it's former ad guys who started like, it's like they assemble freelancers and free, freelancers can get work through this like hub and they're massive. Mm -hmm. um, but they did a survey amongst thousands of agency creatives. The amounts that have left to freelance that are experiencing burnout uh, and different like uh, questions around burnout was like really, really high. So um, I think creatives need to push up against the system. I think we need to educate. Um, I'm trying to do that. I think that's where I want to move things from like helping copywriters, which you really, all this is just, I thought about helping myself. <laughs> so what I wish I had earlier and uh, I can't change that, but I can help other people do it. Um, so, but, but my advice to people, my best advice and a lot of creatives don't like this, that, you know, you're kind of structuring creativity, uh, adding a process. You can't, you know, it's an art, man. Like there are some like, whatever I call them, orthodox uh, creatives that would fight against that. Uh, but I think that's the key, you know, um, something called, oh, what's it called? Uh, lateral integration. They're like left brain, right brain. Oh. And I think what happens in the creative world, it's separate. Even you got account side creative, like it's not different. Um, and by identifying with this no process process and just winging it. And I remember uh -huh. even saying, you know, you can wear whatever you want to work. Oh yeah, I love my job. I used to say this and I knew as I was saying it, that I was full of shit. Oh, I can take my sketchbook and go, you know, we're on the coast here, hang my feet in the water and come up with ideas. Oh, I can show up whenever I want and leave whenever I want. There was something like all those things were true, but there was something about it that never felt right mm -hmm. for me. That I was lying to myself because I knew it was really hard. Um, and I think the key is making creativity way more boring. I think thinking of it as magic is killing uh, people, uh, creatives. Uh, it's not. I think if we can make creativity way more boring and unsexy and add more structure, I think that's how you can kind of, we could start. We'd be way better creatives. I think you have to leave room, obviously, for it to be like what it could be anything. Yeah. But all, all you need when you're creative is a start, something in front of you to make better to think about differently. Um, and there's these cards that I always shout these guys out. Ad House in New York City, Tom Christman is someone I'm like a big fan of and listen to his podcast. And he's a, one of the deans with Paul Fix of uh, ad house and they've put out these cards it's a deck of cards i think it's just called ad house of cards there's 35 cards and it's based on like science it mm -hmm. shows there's there was a crazy study done not by them that said all advertising it was like 90 percent can be traced to these six techniques and then then what these cards are are 35 different approaches inspired from those six techniques mm -hmm. so 
you can use them. And, you know, they're meant to just be like, just like fuel or inspiration when you're concepting. And I think they're really onto something with that. It's now become a course. Um, I th- and, and that really resonates with me. And I think it just proves that most of you look at movies, like they're all the same, different characters, different, whatever, scary person. <laughs> well, there's some great frameworks and processes in, in your book. So um, it's uh, highly recommended. When can people get hold of this, Dan? When is your book coming out? Uh, I think they have to have me on their podcast so I can send them an unfinished version. Uh, they can get it sooner. Uh, no, you know what? I, I, I think within a month, I'm having some issues. Uh, there is a strong learning curve. I'm self-publishing. On my eyeline, I bet has been so weird uh, through this whole time. I keep noticing I'm looking at you and then the camera. Um, I'm hoping within a month. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so I've hired, uh, I told you earlier, a a publishing consultant. Finally, I needed the help to get this thing done quickly. And this person is is currently ghosting me. (laughs) I hope hope she's okay. Uh, I hope to hear from her uh, soon. I bet you she's messaging me here uh, while we're doing this, uh, hopefully. But if not... um, you know what, it's kind of a kick in the ass for me to get going and do some of the things I was going to pay, uh, pay her to do. Uh, okay. So, so let's say, uh, what's the date? September 17th. You can buy a, a self-help guide for copywriters, uh, October 17th. I'll make it October 19th. That's my number. I like the number or, 19. Or a nice Christmas gift for somebody. <laughs> there you go. Yes. <laughs> <It's too late. laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's see. Sometime, sometime. Hey, just last question. You, you've spoken a lot about, um, ideas and you got tons of ideas where where are they coming from where do you get your inspiration is it from your i don't know your socialization when you grow up were you living with funny people where do you go now for inspiration well yeah i think there's i mean i my head goes two places there's what shaped me um and then there's now uh, which i don't know um yeah what shaped me i'll do this quickly i think naturally i'm a rule follower I just wanted to be a good boy as a kid. Um, But my life was kind of chaotic. Rules were broken all around me. My older brothers, uh, it wasn't a ton of structure, which is interesting, which that's what I'm, ah, that's funny. This has been a whole therapy session. I didn't realize this book is all about structure. I didn't have it growing up. So I missed school a lot. I barely graduated high school. Um, But my, because the rules were broken around me, like curfews. So I was watching things I shouldn't have been watching at night. And my older brothers, they were really funny. They were taught me how to break rules. And um, so I think I had this kind of duality. I think that's what kind of makes me a decent strategist and, and, and creative as well. So that's, I think, what shaped me. Uh, and uh, I think now where I get inspired, man, you know, I wasn't inspired at all for years. I always wanted to do something other than, you know, writing for brands something for myself, which I want everyone in the world, especially advertising creatives to do. I think it's so important um, to have full creative control to just do whatever the hell you want, whenever you want, however you want. I think it's very important. Because I think once you start, that's when you get ideas, you have something to think about. I shared a post, well, I don't know when it was, a few days ago on, on LinkedIn about Norm Macdonald, a Canadian comedian, um yeah. I, it was a tribute to him i just had mm-hmm. this thought that hey you know what i'm going to take his jokes and then i'm going to uh, you know interpret them as as if they were a copywriting technique mm-hmm. and i did it in one night that next morning i thought ah this this is not very good i'm not going to share it uh, i actually messaged a friend and he said yeah i think it's good it makes sense and it's important to you to do it and i was like yeah whatever it's all about learning it's gotten like the most popular post i've ever shared yeah it's got a well, last looked it was over a hundred thousand something views which is um a lot for linkedin um and my point is if i hadn't been sharing content or started doing this i wouldn't have had that idea i had also had the idea a while ago to do the same thing with like rap lyrics and tie them to like a um a copywriting tip and so for you oh yeah about your burnout what you were talking about before yeah uh, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Ice cube. There you go. There you go. Nice. nice. <laughs> that's the first one. What would that be? Uh, that's that's check the yourself check you yourself. Wreck yourself. Like, the, the opposite. No, I know what it means. I'm thinking of the copywriting tip. Yeah, that's the, like, avoid burnout. 
Oh yeah. Okay. There you go. I right, stop. Yeah, okay. I oh, got much. it. I oh, got it. I'm thinking yeah. of like, I have these headline techniques. So I'm like, um, anyway, yes. Okay. I got it. I will give you credit. So, <laughs> so anyway, my, my point is, you know, cause I'll get people when I write something like that and it does well, like, Oh, how did you come up with this? But it's, you get momentum. You just got to mm -hmm. start. And it, it's hard to start. It's hard to kind of keep going. It's hard to always don't do it. No, I'm kidding. It's not hard to always keep going. It's hard to start. Mm. You're just overcoming your like what re internal resistance, but it gets easy. It gets hard to not do it after a while. You just have to get past that threshold of whatever you're doing for yourself. You can yeah. do it. You just have to do it. And it took me a long, long, long time. And I encourage everyone to, to create something for yourself. Like, I don't know, you have this podcast, like how, I know it's for a company, but it's, it's you doing it. Like, how, I don't know. How does it feel for you to do it? Uh, it it's a lot of work. Cause I do a lot of research for yeah. each, each guest and everything. You but have yeah, to you, read books. <laughs> yeah. Tons. And, uh, but yeah, you, you, you get into that momentum and, uh, yeah. and if you're enjoying it, it's, it's, it's not really too taxing. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, hey, awesome. I know that you said in your book that you don't like being put on the spot because you have all these uh, frameworks and stuff and the processes that you go through and you need the time and everything. But I want to ask you, oh, here comes the freeze frame. <laughs> I want to ask you a question that I normally end with. And actually, uh, Trevor Noah stole it. And uh, I saw him asking Anthony Fauci this question the other night. So uh, this might be the last time I ever ask it. Uh, but, yeah. So you have to choose to fight between a horse sized duck or 100 <laughs> duck sized horses, which do you choose to fight and why? Oh, wow. I've been asked this many times. No, no I haven't. Never. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to go. I'm going to go uh, straight, Dan. This is me, uh, my left brain. And I'll see if I can do a right brain one. My left brain, uh, I'm going to do some math. Uh, for, I'm going to say a duck weighs about five pounds. Uh, and there's a hundred of them. That's a hundred horse, a uh, hundred duck, duck sized, duck sized they're, horses. So I'm going to call one it, horse sized duck. So they're five pounds each times a hundred. That's 500 pounds. And a horse is probably like what? 1500 pounds. So I would take the little guys. I think I could squash a bit of actual, like if I'm really in a fight for my life, um, I think it might be more impressive to, like if I lost to the duck, it wouldn't be as embarrassing. I think the picture of the newspaper, but now if I use my right brain and, and take this into uh, the marketing world, I think if you want something done, you never, never give it to a, a committee. I think the, uh, the hundred might be uh, disorganized. You'd have a bunch of people who were, didn't know what to do. I think you'd have a bunch of people, um, probably weren't paying attention. It didn't want to be there. You'd have uh, just layers and decision-making. You'd have people asking, is this the right thing to do? Um, I think they'd be too disorganized. So if I'm answering from that side, yeah. I think either way, I'm going to take the hundred little ones. I, okay. could, I, could, I could smoke them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I've never, I've asked that question thousands of times in my corporate really? career and stuff. I've, I've never had that, uh, that analysis at the front of that brilliant stuff. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Okay, Dan, just tell everyone where they can uh, find you uh, right. for your newsletter and LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Newsletter is nelkincreative.com. Uh, or you can just find me, Dan Nelkin, on LinkedIn. Uh, add me as a, a contact. You can follow me or send an invite. I don't need a message. You don't have to. If you can't think of anything, just I'll accept it. Um, don't try and sell me anything. But uh, yeah, fire away with any questions. I'll, I will always... Uh, get back to you uh whatever your question is uh, great and i will put those links in the show notes as well okay. dan thank you so much for your time um I, I, you know i know everyone's time is so precious and yeah. uh i'm really really grateful and i'm a huge huge fan of your words so uh long may it yeah. succeed the newsletter and the book as well thank you wow. so much wow. Th thank you so much that really means a lot i, I still yeah i'm just i'm just taken aback always that people are having a positive experience and liking it and uh, yeah hopefully i get used to it but uh, I'm, I'm not yes yet uh, so thank you very much i appreciate that and great to meet you and, and thanks for asking i really enjoyed this